All right. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Gerard Malanson. I have the honor to serve as your panelist, as your actual, uh, not panelist, but I will be your host uh, for the afternoon. Uh, real quick, I'm the National Green Jobs Advisory Council Director uh, with NCWE, and we're so blessed to have the opportunity to be funded by the Lumina uh, Association, Lumina Foundation, actually. Uh, the main focus for the National Green Jobs Advisory Council is to develop green modules, and we'll have our good friend Maria Fife talk about where those modules are on Skills Common, um, but also trying to get more BIPOC individuals into the green revolution. And uh, and as of today, uh, we have some wonderful panelists uh, to talk about what they're doing, particularly with their organization, about getting more women into uh, the manufacturing energy and the green sector. I will turn it over to our Loris, wonderful executive director of NCWE, and that's Dr. Darlene Miller, to give the welcome for NCWE. Darlene. Good morning, everyone. Um, so glad that you could join us this morning and so excited for this panel conversation. Um, I am Darlene Miller. I am the executive director of the National Council for Workforce Education. Uh, for those that uh, don't know NCWE, we are a nonprofit organization. We work mainly with community colleges uh, in the field and space of workforce education. We are an organization that is all about the practitioners, about the people that do the work uh, in workforce education on the ground. And so we're very proud of making sure that that is our focus uh, and that we stay committed to uh, supporting the practitioners. NCWE also hosts the SEED Center, which is a sustainability education and and, and and employment center. It was uh, started in about 2015, uh, and it is really a mainly a, a a website of resources that are available uh, to community and technical colleges and others across the country uh, of resources and curriculum uh, that is free and available to folk to use. So we're very excited about this opportunity and thank the Lumina Foundation for this funding and this project. Um, I think you'll be very uh, excited about some of the um, curriculum um, that's that's free and available to folks. I think you'll also be very excited. Uh, at the end, I'll put up a slide on the um, marketing toolkit that was developed uh, and uh, that that's a, a great tool for folks to use. And just on a personal note, this is a very personal and important conversation for me. Um, those of you who don't know me well don't know that I am educated as an engineer and went through an engineering program, both a, a master's degree in engineering back when there were 250 guys in the room and Darlene. And so this is a very important conversation for me and something that I have been working in this field uh, for a very long time um, and ran camps and summer programs for girls, trying to get girls more excited about careers in non-traditional occupations. So I'm excited that we're able to put this focus on women in green jobs in this grant, and I'm excited for this conversation. So I am going to remind everybody to turn your cameras off, to put yourself on mute, uh, and the uh, speakers will be on camera and off mute. And then at the end, uh, you will have the opportunity to answer questions. So Gerard, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and let's get started, thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Darlene, I appreciate it. And then also, while you have a question in your mind, please put your question in the chat box too. And uh, like Darlene said, feel free to turn off if you're you're not on on panel. Feel free to turn off your um, your video. You can eat lunch or just relax. So um, so yeah. So we're gonna get it started. Uh, I'm I'm so excited to have these great organizations of IREC, um, HBACR, and uh, um, Hard Hatted Women and wise pathways with us uh, all in one with uh so we um, those presenters will be cynthia finley uh marcia um and casey and they are so phenomenal and we're so excited to have them speak to us and give us guidance on how we could be more inclusive and uh find seeds of wisdom to move forward with so to get things started i'm first going to have dr finley kick us off and give us some where she is and who she's with.
Hi, good. Well, it's afternoon here. I'm in Virginia on the East Coast, but I guess good morning to those of you that are all the way out West. I'm Cynthia Finley, the Vice President of Workforce and Strategic Innovation with Interstate Renewable Energy Council, also known as IREC. Um, and Gerard, did you want me to present here or pass it for introductions? Yes, let's pass it over to Marsha. Okay. I'm sorry. Hi, welcome. I'm Marsha Christensen. Uh, I am the president of a nonprofit called Women in HVACR. We've been around since 2003, recognizing that while half the world is made of women, there's only about 12% of the industry of this industry that is has jobs in, in the HVC industry. And if you look at the text, it's even less. And so our mission really has been to provide connections for those people. Um, and we're all volunteers. And the, what I do in my day job is I run a business unit for uh, Pico Control Systems, which is a division of Astronics. Great, thanks, Marsha and Casey. Hello, everyone. Uh, so excited to join you today. Um, and I'm so excited to be um, on this panel with a uh, very esteemed panelist. My name is Casey Roach. I am the Executive Director of Hard Hatted Women or HHW Ohio. We are a nonprofit located in um, the state of Ohio, as you might have surmised from our name. Uh, we focus on um, inspiring and supporting women in what are considered non-traditional careers from the Department of Labor. So any career pathway in which women represent uh, less than 25% of the workforce. Uh, this includes critical um, technical and STEM career pathways, and we work really closely with partners through our WISE Pathways program, which we will be sharing a little bit more about soon. So Gerard, I think I pass it back to you for uh, a deeper dive into our organizations. Yes, thank you so much, Keisha. I appreciate it. So uh, the first question, we're gonna kick it off back to Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, please give us an update regarding your newly published solar census survey. And uh, please highlight some of the interesting findings regarding women in the solar industry. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, hopefully you all can see my screen. Let's see. Um, well, I'm Cynthia Finley, Vice President at IREC for Workforce. Um, I'm just going to give you a little background about IREC. For over 40 years, IREC has made clean energy possible for millions of Americans through cutting edge solutions, advancing renewable energy, electric grid modernization, and energy efficiency. And we continue that work today in response to the urgent need to transition the clean energy and to mitigate climate change, improve resiliency for our communities, to ensure that all people can benefit from a clean energy future. We have three divisions, regulatory workforce and community, all weaving in programs and efforts to make this happen. Um, and we recently released our 13th annual National Solar Job Census in July. And this report tracks solar job growth, demographics, and workforce development in solar and other clean energy industries. As of 2022, there were over 263,000 social worker, solar workers nationwide. Uh, it's a 3.5% increase from 2021. The states that added the most solar jobs in 2022 included California, New York, and Texas. Um, we also found out that women made up 31% of the solar workforce in 2022. And looking back five years, the proportion of women in solar has increased from 27% to 31% since 2017. So the good news is that there are even more increased opportunities for women in solar and solar adjacent or clean energy adjacent jobs, but there's still room for improvement. I'll be linking the census in today, but just some quick snapshots. When it comes to diversity and inclusion, the solar industry faces similar challenge to other industries competing for the same talent pool. For instance, within the solar installation and project development sector, 30% of the workforce is female. In the U.S. construction sector, the proportion is only 11%. 
The solar manufacturing sector has about the same percentage of women employees as the overall U.S. manufacturing sector. So you can see here where the dark blue line is the, U the workforce in general and the light blue line is solar. So you can see where women fare in, in these two areas of the overall workforce and construction. And then we've got here the breakdown between wholesale trades where you can see women inch out a little bit over the regular workforce. Repair and maintenance, we are further behind and neck and neck with manufacturing. So those were some interesting findings to see where we fall, where women fall with the regular workforce. But this is just some of the data that IREC is going to use in development of workforce programs specific to outreach, education and training, apprenticeship and employment. And we think that those areas are where we can work harder to make outreach accessible to women in diverse populations, access to education and training easier, um, and apprenticeship and employment. We currently have several initiatives that we're working on to better integrate diversity into the clean energy space. And one of those is the National Clean Energy Workforce Alliance. Um, I invite you all to join the Workforce Alliance if you haven't already done so. With over 500 members strong and in partnership with NCWE, we're working to bring workforce solutions to scale. We'll launch our webinar series on August 17th at 2 p.m., the State of the Workforce, where we'll dig into a little bit more about the solar census, as well as the DOE jobs report, and really talk about how we can leverage best practices with one another and bring some of these solutions to scale. And then we also have a LinkedIn group here where I would invite you all to join to further discuss and share best practices. And I know we're going to talk about a lot of that today on this panel and what we think is going to happen in the workforce and what some of those solutions are. But I'd like to invite you all to join this group as well as we move forward to share some of your experiences and best practices. But I'll turn it over to Gerard and the rest of the group uh, for questions. Oh, wonderful. Cynthia, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And it, it's a telling, I love how you have the, you know, just that females, but also the separation of ethnicities. Uh, and I love, I know your work on target focuses. We we were blessed back in World War II and stuff. We had Rosie the Riveter, but you're trying to make sure Rosie the River don't look all the same and bringing some more diversity into all women into the manufacturing and solar sector, which is amazing. It's, it's funny that you mentioned that. Rosie the Riveter came up in conversation this week, and I love Rosie. She's great, but I'd like us to keep in mind that those two million women were also laid off after the war. So that's mm -hmm. not, we, we want to change that path. We want them to have career pathways and stay in the workforce. But yes, I think we can, can work on, on getting some more women and just diverse communities in general in clean energy. Yes, wonderful and very good points. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to our two organizations, HBACR and Wise Pathways and um, and Hard Hatted Women, uh, with Casey and Marsha. Uh, I want I want to know who's going to ask, answer the, these questions first. So uh, I'm going to throw it out there, and who, who's willing to answer first, just jump in. Uh, in regard to getting more women into the field, how is your organization? currently partnering with community colleges and community-based organizations. So I see Casey, you, you jumped on first, go ahead. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, HHW, uh, we partner really closely with our um, community colleges and our community-based organizations uh, through our WISE Pathways Framework. So WISE stands for Women in Sustainable Employment. Um, it is a career exploration and career readiness framework, which brings together um, industry representatives, um, education and training professionals, and community-based organizations to help women explore different pathways that are available to them within their community um, and uh, find the education and training that uh, is needed to be successful within these careers and then make um, their transition, whether that be into uh, directly into employment, into an apprenticeship, or into additional education and training. Um, right now, we work um, in seven communities throughout the state of Ohio with our WISE Pathways program. Uh, the great thing about WISE is that it is um, endlessly customizable to local context. 
For example, um, we are working with the city of Cleveland um, through their built environment project. Um, and that focuses on careers within the renewable energy sector, as well as um, residential and commercial construction and infrastructure. We're working in a completely different way with our partners in Youngstown, where uh, we just hosted a Wise Pathways program uh, for women going into advanced manufacturing careers. And so those career pathways looked at, um, you know, things like automation and robotics, uh, 3D printing and uh, cybersecurity. So um, we're really um, working with our partners to make sure that women uh, know what is available for them within their local economy, how they can support themselves while they're in education and training. That's where our community-based partners come in. And then, um, you know, we make connections with uh, women that we call our role models, who are women who are already working within the field, who come back, uh, mentor, talk to the women uh, who are in our Wise Pathways programs so that they can reach back while they climb. So with that, I'd love to hear a little bit about how Marsha is working with her within her community. Right, so um, we are a national organization. We have about a thousand members and we use some of our members to do what we call an ambassador program that reach out into the community. But first and foremost in the HVC side, we have really got a visibility um, and an optics issue because a lot of people don't even really know that HVC is a, a valid career path and particularly for women, um, many are, most people are unaware of the earning potentials in the HV society. It's a very lucrative business and it's a great place for women to go. Uh, there's not uh, a ton of women in the industry. And really that goes back to where we were founded was to bring some of that into the industry. And we, do that in a number of different ways. Um, one way is we are, we've started an endowment currently this year. Um, we offered six $5,000 scholarships. Uh, those can get used in the trades or they can get used for a four-year degree as long as it's targeted at the HVC industry. And we hope to grow that beyond what we have now. Um, we started with a one thousand one one thousand dollar one um, uh, ten years ago, so um, it's grown uh, immensely. Um, we're also looking at trying to get more people um, connected with our membership, and we once a week have a Friday Zoom call that uh, is all over the deck. Um, it can be anything from technical. I know some of you may be. Um, familiar with the refrigeration changes that are coming down the pike and and how companies that's it's a huge issue at most all all levels of of the industry and so we have we have seminars um, on that everything from that to navigating um, business growth for yourself building a presence in for yourself and how to succeed in the marketplaces and then overcoming obstacles so we're helping women grow their careers as well uh, as reaching um, down into the communities. And one of the big efforts we're trying to make is to get our, our membership to go when there's a, a school project, as career day, um, there's nothing stopping any one of our members from going to their kid's school and talking about HVC as, as, a, as a valid career. So it's more a little bit more of a grassroots uh, approach to um, you know, making people aware that this is, you know, you don't need a four-year degree to make a good, good wage and have a, a successful uh, career. And so that's uh, basically what our organization is doing. And with that, I'll pass it back. Casey and Marsha, thank you so much. Asha, Marsha, you know, I'm in Louisiana, so you know, I, I hate to say I worship anything, but I, I, I I love my AC, oh. so especially when it's working and when there's a you good know, technician to quickly fix it is even better. So um, all things, I love what you're doing. And uh, it was one of the 17 essential businesses that they uh, designated during COVID. And I'm here to tell you, most people won't go without their air conditioning. So. Oh no, yeah, oh no, yeah. Like, 
Uh, that's almost above plumbing uh, in many cases. <laughs> so, so, uh, so appreciate it. So I still got some more questions for y'all. Um, I want you, I want y'all to really share with us because you, 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 you mentioned a lot of partnerships. You've been doing a lot of things, but some, some, some little details, um, key things. What are some key lessons learned um, that have made strong partnerships and helped women build strong careers in your sector? Um, I would just say, first of all, um, being able to see things as they clearly are, uh, you know, you can look at situation and know you're being discriminated against or something, but you need to see it clearly and in order to be able to uh, figure out how you're going to get around that, because sometimes it isn't, you know, it isn't obvious. Um, the other thing is that I think as women, we tend to not ask for what we want. <laughs> It's a, you know, we just live with it. And so those, and then also taking time for ourselves, uh, me time, because I, I know um, for women, we tend to be the family. We tend to be the ones that make dinner at night. We tend to, you know, we're at our jobs and we're worried about all these other things that a lot of times our, our men folk or our spouses or whoever they are, the significant others aren't necessarily worrying about. And so, um, kind of that's that's uh some of the discussions i think we need to have as as women in the industry and how, how other people are overcoming those Thank you. yes and and i would echo um much of what marcia just said that it is important especially as we are engaging women at, at the start of their career or maybe within a career transition where they're coming from a sector like perhaps uh, healthcare or retail or food service where uh, women are equally or sometimes overrepresented and then making that transition into a field where um, you know uh, they are going to be underrepresented. And so developing those those strong community based partnerships uh, so that you know when you're working with women, you know because uh, every woman is is different and and we come with so many different intersections. Um, so, uh, our community-based organizations really help us support women and make sure that their needs are being addressed, whatever those are. So if they have, um, you know, if they're transitioning to a different sort of shift work, right, maybe they were working for a shift and now they're working second or third, working with those community-based organizations to help them think through, okay, how am I going to secure childcare now? Um, as Marcia said, oftentimes parenting is left to women, and those decisions are made by women. And so uh, providing those resources through those community-based partnerships is, is really essential. The other thing that we do is we work a lot with our employer partners on the employer side to make sure that women um, have a sense of belonging and uh, see that uh, they do, they, they can not only survive but thrive within these careers. And so helping our employer partners understand, you know, like, yes, we are helping you connect to an untapped resource of talent, uh, but also we want to make sure that these are quality jobs when they get there, uh, that these are jobs that, um, you know, a, a woman can have work-life balance, a family life with it, um, and that uh, the facilities are such that uh, women feel comfortable within them, right? Uh, so whether that's going to be, uh, like physical facilities, like making sure that nursing rooms are available for women uh, within within the work site, or if that's flexible scheduling so that they can balance their lives, uh, working in partnership in that way to, to make sure that the women that we are connecting with employers are supported and can, uh, you know, uh, find their, you know, their journey within these careers. Now, Casey, thank you so much. That's that very good information. And uh, thank you for those thoughts. Uh, Cynthia, I see you popped on. I wonder if you had anything to share with us too. Yeah, just to, to echo what Casey said, some of the work we're doing at IREC, it's it's really important and just two, two approaches. And one comes from not my work at IREC, but working in higher education and workforce is really taking a look at the data, like the data that I presented about where, where people are going. But when you're looking at your enrollment data for colleges, or you're looking at the, the data to see, well, where, where are you recruiting? 
most of the women or where are you recruiting most of the men? And to, to your example, Casey, there aren't a lot of men in healthcare. Traditionally, we'll have women go into healthcare and men will go into the trades. And so let's take a look at our marketing and outreach to see if maybe we're just missing a group altogether. But to that turn, we want to at IREC look at the employers and we're starting to develop some resources for training for diversity, equity, and inclusion for contractors. We talk a lot about employers in this space, but the reality is that these are oftentimes small contractor-based organizations that are not prepared to accept diverse populations into their workforce. So having them rethink their strategy, are your policies inclusive? You know, do you have inclusive work culture? Are we communicating that culture to the folks that we're trying to bring into these jobs, but how they can better serve and learn to help reduce the barriers of underserved populations in their workforce so that we can increase retention. Hiring is one thing, but statistically speaking, most people in, in underserved communities, they'll leave that job within six months because as Casey mentioned, they don't feel that connection um, and they don't see themselves. They don't see themselves in higher positions in that pathway. So really making sure that we highlight career pathways for women and that the contractors and industry partners recognize that as well as a valuable asset, because if we can maintain retention, that's a cost saving for any employer. And oh, may I add to that, Jared? Yes, please. Uh, so thank you for, for mentioning those, uh, those um, pathways are, are so essential to retention. We know that um, you know women being able to see opportunities for advancement are critical to keeping them within within a company, within a, a role, or within a, a career pathway. Um, and that's again, I want to highlight uh, um, that's where our great partners in higher education come in. Um, so uh, where employers can develop those relationships with those higher education partners to offer um, upskilling or additional education and training so that that pathway is clear for women. So where they might enter in an entry level position through partnering with higher education, can they then go back to school while I'm still working and I'm still learning, right? So that I don't have to take time off of my job. I can maybe take classes in the evening, um, have those earn and learn pathways that we know are so successful um, and supporting women. Um, you know, so I can I can get those skills that I need to get to the next position um, while I'm I'm working, and then continue that pathway until I'm I'm at a role where, you know, um, I feel comfortable, and and that's that's where I, I would like to you know my, maybe my terminal uh, uh, position. So um, just want to highlight again that within that that pathway, that's our our higher education partners um, and community college partners are are essential. So there's, a, there's a there's a question in the chat that I think might um, okay pertinent well, to all of them. Perhaps Marsha can address this. And the question is, um, Robert asks, I've noticed in the institution there's a higher enrollment of women in welding, automotive, and electrical, though not huge, than HVACR. Is there something that makes these pathways more attractive to women? I. I, I actually don't have a good answer for that, except that I think that HVCR is not, um, we just haven't done a good job of providing visibility to that. I mean, you look at any ad you see for HVC and it's always some young white guy in, in the, but next to the truck or this. So that's one thing that we've really tried to do is to provide images for, for the for our industry, um, women in HVCR has one of the largest uh, collections of of um, pic pictures for that. So if you need something, let me know. Uh, oh, that's wonderful! Yeah, yeah, it's people got to see it to believe it. In many cases, uh, so thank you. And, and this question kind of is a build on that too. And uh, you know, Cynthia kind of kicked it off a little bit, but. You know, especially a lot of a lot of our um, participants, the participants, the people joining us today are with, a typical, with some type of training provider or a community college and so forth. And but there's always that gap. And, and in case you kind of mentioned, so and especially as a training provider, I was one for a very long time. You know, you just want them to get that door open and in. 
but there's so many every every group uh has a, a certain nuance to kind of excel and kind of expand and flourish in that occupation and sector so i'm curious what do you all kind of do to prepare women to flourish in primarily primarily male dominant roles and how can you know and what do the training providers do well to help prepare women for that first step AC, um, I, I, you know, from from our standpoint, it, it's an education uh, and an encouragement to do networking and mentorship. We have a really robust, large mentorship program in, in our organization that comes along with our membership. So we're partnering people who've, who, you know, older people who've been there, done that, with young people coming into the into the industry. So they have somebody to chat with. Also, um, we have a Facebook page, but I know other people do as well. So get connected up with um, the, those kinds of resources. And uh, the other uh, key thing is, is net with your networking, you need to have a good network no matter who you are. And one of the best ways, uh, a really great way to do that is, is training is a great opportunity to network with other people that are doing the same thing you are there. So, so those uh, relationships that you build in the classrooms, um, they should be encouraged to continue those, uh, those relationships out into their you know, workforce because those will be great resources for them uh, going forward. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, a thumbs up to everything uh, Marcia just said, especially about um, you know the importance of the mentors and and you know showing the next generation of women um, that you know it is possible that these jobs are for them that we do belong in these fields is is so essential um, as far as what can our training partners do to help make sure that women are supported. I think it's too, um, and I've, I've seen, um, you know, uh, in the chat, like the, the importance of inclusive marketing. And I think that's definitely a part of it, but also thinking through, um, are there opportunities to bring in, you know, those, those mentors into the classroom? And then also, can you provide work-based learning um, so that, women um, or, or anyone who might be underrepresented can go out, um, get a feel for what it's like to be on the job um, while you're still connected to that training organization, that training provider. So it, it feels a little bit safer, right? Uh, have an opportunity to explore, to, to figure out, is this, you know, is this company culture supportive? Uh, what do I look for in a supportive culture? And so uh, critical supports at, at um, community colleges would in, include like your career services department, right? Who can coach you through what um, to look for in, in a, an employer and, and how to know that they might be a good fit for you. Um, how to coach through interview questions where you can ask, right? Um, what does the schedule look like? What, what will my benefits look like? Um, and know so that women go into these, these um, interviews feeling like they are empowered um, and they don't just have to take a job, right? Uh, because, you know, they're in an interview, right? So uh, career services are, are super critical and uh, of, are super critical in this, this ecosystem of support for women. And Gerard, Charlene is asking about the perception idea, um, you know, around some of some occupations. So for example, plumbing, you know, it, it is seen as kind of a dirty job, you know, your fingernails are going to be dirty. So, so is that part of it? And how do employers get past that and support women entering? Into the field? I, I also think it's sometimes it's the way we talk. Um, you know, you'll see people say, well, oh, this, this girl can do this, you know, and that sort of puts the girl in a weird situation. Like, almost like if I can do it, anyone can do it. it. It's more of a put down when somebody's thinking that they're trying to make them look good. And so um, with another thing that gets said a lot, a lot is it that's a male dominated field and we should change that and say it's predominantly male, but it's not dominated by men. 
there's just a lot of ways that we in the industry need to change how we do business. Yeah, agree. And and something we've also seen too, and and um, you know, we have there's this idea that women don't do physical labor, but I would invite anyone to to tell a nurse that she doesn't have a physical job, and see what kind of reaction you get. Right. So uh, just thinking about like where we accept the physical labor that women do put in, and what might that look like. Um, and, and sort of changing the narrative around that, as, as Marcia said, like that these, you know, women are already working very physical jobs. Women are already working dirty jobs. Um, you know, they're in, in construction, right? There is going to be some sort, you know, like it, it, it that job is what it is. Like being dirty is, is going to be part of it some days. Um, but, you know, we can also change the narrative around other um industry such as manufacturing, where uh, we will actually take women, um, our partner, and I see uh, uh, a representative here from Lorain County Community College, they have a clean room uh, that they train for their um, mechatronics program, and it is a thousand times cleaner than an operating room. And so it's just changing the narrative about what manufacturing looks like. It's it's not a dirty job at all in some, in some facilities. So I think uh, it's as, as Marcia said, just absolutely reframing the conversations and, and being very mindful of the language that we are using. No, Casey, Marcia, and, and Cynthia, all very good points. The language is very important. Uh, and then also, I, I think schools too, as, as provi um, training providers, even employers, recruiting, you know, since Title IX has been in place, there are phenomenal women athletes that come out and, and, and they work as, you know, teams, but there's very little work. I haven't seen target recruiting, you know, this is like, you know, you know, if you play softball or soccer, you're used to training, working out in cold rain, you know, ACL injuries and so forth. And, uh, and I don't think that's really recognized and, and built upon. So I think there's a lot we do. And, um, and I love that your aspects of mentorships, showing the nuances is, you know, certain vendors make nice, you know, clothing for all people and just kind of know where they are. It's just not, one size gloves that fits all and uh, and so forth. So no, very good points. I, I do want to uh, transition with everybody actually to kind of jump in on this is some more of a map, um, uh, get away from the micro, but more of a macro kind of look at the industries that you all are involved with. And kind of the, um, I'd say you guys are doing extremely good work. And it's always the, one of Newton's law, I don't know if it's the second or third, uh, with actor, um, for every reaction, there's an um, equal um, or equal or more reaction to it, uh, opposite. And so when you're doing good, somebody's also trying to do negative at the same time. So I'm curious uh, what you all see from the next three to five years. Uh, we'll start with the bad, but we'll go with the good. Uh, what do you see concerning, if, or if there's not anything, then there's nothing. But I'm sure from your point of view, What's concerning for you for women excelling in, in your occupation in the next three to five years? I guess that's me. No, I, you know, more con when I think of concerning is, is the piece of it that is the change in technology and legislation. I think those are the things that are going to drive a lot of change and a lot of training and requirements to think differently and and uh, who knows where that's all going to end up. I would not be the one to write the thesis on that. So um, I would just leave it there. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Well, how about this? The next three to five years, what do you all feel that's very promising? Um, I personally am looking forward to a lot of change in technology and design. Um, AI is going to allow a lot of um, innovation in, um, I guess, the, the quality of design of HVAC systems and the ability for them to self-diagnose. Um, also, sensor technologies are are getting a lot cheaper and becoming on some of the microprocessors. And that will also allow indoor air quality, which has become a real hotbed um, to um, 
become get down into the actual room that they're in because you think about you know we all drive to work in those buildings that are sitting next to the freeway you don't necessarily want to be bringing in inside outside outdoor air in there even though it's cooler than the inside it's polluted so um I, those i think those are real positive things uh, yeah no, that's wonderful. And, and Marsha, I can probably see too, especially you said the, you know, the troubleshooting and, and processes, I guess also frees up for individuals. They don't have to be at site, you know, um, some, you know, the whole work from home is still very popular and it's very flexible for a lot, especially for a single parent. Um, you almost could do the troubleshooting on your laptop at home to keep a system up and going. And you have that as remote controls already, but that's, those are definitely you know, for us to give us more freedom over time. So that's, that's good too. Uh, Cynthia, I see you jumped on. I know, I know you're tracking trends and you're trying to lead, you're trying to influence trends. So I'm curious from what you see. Um, yeah, so we're working on a Green Workforce Connect platform that's going to do a lot of what Marcia and Casey already mentioned, showing videos of what the actual jobs look like. What is a day in the life? How much can I make? What is the culture of this work? And then connect job seekers to training and then employers but one of the pieces of that is also going to be uh, attracting the workforce the future workforce so the k-12 system and i think with the expansion of stem and all of the other opportunities for girls and education that we have an opportunity to sort of capitalize on bringing those options to a younger generation of girls who may not have ever considered it someone told me the other day most kids want to be veterinarian or firemen, or whatever they see around them, what their parents are. And if you don't see your mom as a power lineman or working at HVAC or a welder, you might not know that that's even an option. And so how can we get into a younger generation, maybe those career and technical classes um, for girls is another way to really help make sure that we're not only filling the gap that exists today, but the gap that's gonna continue to exist if we don't really change the mindset about women in some of these industries and to, to Casey and Marsh's point, it's most job, I mean, a teacher, that's a really dirty job. I mean, I don't know what germs you would come home with being a teacher, but I would take crawling under someone's house or working in solar any day um, over getting, you know, hand, foot and mouth or whatever it is the kids bring home, right? So I think there's a way to, to frame it that can be attractive to, to women coming into this industry, but really focusing on tomorrow's workforce as well. Great points, Casey. Yeah, absolutely. And and I would say, you know, um, echoing uh, the same sort of uh, concerning trends, um, I think it's more in the ecosystem or in the or in the policy, I guess. Um, I, we're watching something, uh, you know, some states shy away from terms like equity or inclusion um, in their efforts. Um, and, and that just creates a, an uncertainty, like sort of, uh, about like, okay, where do we go from here? And, and are these, is it going to remain a priority or not? But on the flip side of that, what we've really seen uh, from the employer side and from the educator side is um, pushes to make sure that um, the next class of, of HVAC um, or the next class of, you know, welders or the next class of uh, machinists are more inclusive of, of uh, folks who have traditionally not been in those seats, right? So there are really great recruitment efforts going on at many community colleges throughout our nation to make sure that uh, these jobs are representative of the communities that they're serving. We're also seeing that a lot of employers are taking up the mantle um, and, and making sure that they have the, the workforce that they need to be successful. Um, you know, we have what's called the silver tsunami coming, which is where in many STEM and technical careers, which are predominantly, thank you, Marcia, for that uh, language, male um, and older and wider, they are all retiring. And so companies are scrambling to figure out where uh, are we going to, like, how are we going to replace these workers? Where are we going to find them? And that's where um, you know, uh, we see recruitment efforts, um, and we also see a lot of in, in corporate responsibility. So, uh, thinking of our partner Intel, who just built a site here in Ohio, they have a fifty percent 
goal for their technician workforce of hiring women. So they want 50% of their technician workforce to be women in a state where technicians make up roughly 23% of the technician workforce. So we have a, a large undertaking to go, but I'm so excited by their enthusiasm and their energy. And they are really driving the conversation um, in our state um, about diversifying the workforce. They also have similar goals uh, for um, uh, BIPOC uh, uh, persons of color um, to make sure that you know our their workforce is reflective of the state that they are working in, and so um, I, I, I'm very encouraged by um, you know uh, the employers and the and the education partners who are um, you know driving a lot of these conversations. Man, Casey, that, that, that's so good to hear too. Um, you know, I think the whole I always challenge a lot of people, and I'm glad a lot of employers and industries um, support DEI just as safety. Uh, nobody's kicking out safety in OSHA because uh, you want everybody to go home safely at the end of the day. And I think a lot of these employers just really want the best and brightest talent and be able to retain it. So they kind of had to have a very diverse and inclusive culture within these firms and or small mom and pop shops. So uh, I, I really think those, I'm glad to hear the trends that you, you're seeing and mm -hmm. the opportunities. I, I echo that in many cases too. Um, but uh, with all of this, and this is why we love this panel is no matter what the opportunity or slots, 50% or whatever, is you want to make sure that uh, the, the, these women are highly trained and better trained than anybody at that shop or floor. And I love that's what you guys are all stressing with the training and opportunities mm -hmm. and being subject matter experts for our, for us as training providers um, to make sure they are exceeding and have the base skills and um, and accelerate skills to move up their career as the years progress. So thank you so much. We are actually a little bit above time. So Maria, can you, can I have you jump on the screen, please? And I don't know if we have, and I know, I see a lot of I, uh, conversations going on, but also I'm trying to follow the yeah. the uh, the panelists. <laughs> so I had a chance to read anything. So I know we got a lot of um, conversation going on. So I don't know if you see any questions that we need to start highlighting and uh, and then maybe we could bring people on the screen because uh, we have, we are a little bit above schedule. Yeah, no, there's been some good conversation in the chat. Um, uh, some of it is about, uh, well, JP mentioned that he's been in the business a long time as a technical specialist, and it, it was really hard for him at the, at the onset. Um, and this effort that we're seeing today is really um, uh, an opportunity for us, along with lots of other things that are happening across the country and, uh, and the globe, to be able to ex expand those uh, experiences that so that our our new folks that are coming into the industry are not walking away feeling like oh my gosh why do I, why am i continuing to battle these things that my father did or my grandfather great grandfather mother may have so if if they had gone into the industry so jp i don't know if you want to say any more about that we're we're happy to open the mic for you yeah i would agree with that um you know both I've been in, like, like I said, I've been in electrical industry, every facet, and it seemed like in my career, you always had to be 10 times better, even if it was, even if the job task unwanted it. Now, both my sons are in the industry now, too, and I've graduated a lot of students out of my program, and I would love to say that that is better than when I started, which it is, I'm not going to say that. But I also, when it comes to females who have graduated from my program, I have gotten quite the amount of shocking horror stories of the type of culture that they said they had to learn to suck up, which is kind of a parallel across what I remember as a young person getting in the field. And I'm glad there's folks out there because that's got to change out. Uh, I mean, that's almost an American issue, whether it's sexist, racist, discriminatory. Some folks said, well, it's not intentional. That's true. At times it's not because, you know, when like folks are in the same room, which in the electrical industry is mostly Caucasian males, you know, they're comfortable speaking a certain way. I even have to curb that in my own classrooms when we have new folks come in. Uh, 
they spoke they speak one way when it's a room full of you know caucasian males and i have to have the talk with them. you know okay now we have may we may have a gay female we may have a gay male we may have a hispanic we may have black you guys got to change your change your entire speech pattern to be professional and so you know recent graduates who are female who have talked to me about that have told me downright what should be just plain is plain up illegal speech but they suck it up to keep their job and that's that's kind of a sad state of affairs but i think underlying that is the reason why a lot of minorities and why a lot of uh females don't go into these trades because they hear them stories from others or they see that behavior when they're sitting maybe sitting in a restaurant and there's a the group of electricians sitting there talking in a certain way and it turns them off so that's just the other side of it that's a lot of folks don't want to talk about you know we talk about the great money benefits all the great things electrical industry's done for me but sometimes we don't talk about that cultural part on the other side, which I think is actually a larger part of why we're not seeing uh, non-traditional folks go into the trades. Yeah, agree. And and thinking about how um, you know teaching our our young people to think about those questions around culture and climate, um, you know that's that's not something that has necessarily been a part of the program. And and thanks to um, to training such as um, you know what Casey supports through the Wise Initiative, those kinds of things they get an opportunity to think it through. What does the day look like? And and um, Stuart and Robert are saying you know it's the heat that's the big issue, and and I can change my shirt and I can I can be presentable to the client than the homeowner then at that point, and 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 it's fine, you know so. Um, it's not a matter of going in there and, and swimming through all this this ick. It's uh, it's not nearly like that. And and some of us who have never been in the industry might think about it that way. But but uh, these programs give people the opportunity to investigate a little further what it could look like. There Maria, is, I, yes. To, to 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 what JT, JP kind of lift up and JP, thank you so much. And actually, JP is one of our distinguished members of the National Green Job Advisory Council, faculty member. We'll talk about where to find his module. Uh, Maria mentioned where yeah. to, to locate his module he has developed for us. Um, but back to culture, and you did mention we talked a lot of it's about people starting their careers, but you have supervision and culture of an organization, and there's. Um, and I'm curious, I'm not sure probably with uh, uh, Marsha or, or Casey, are y'all have been involved with any incumbent worker or, or first line supervision training to kind of things to look at like, hey, you know, you just maybe not want to have one porta potty or just general standards of just how to day in the life, how to keep the porta potty respectable for all people, um, let alone conversations and politics and all that stuff. Do you, are y'all involved with that? type of training or anything? Uh, yeah, so, um, and I'm sure Marsha is as well. Uh, we work um, through a statewide initiative uh, with the Ohio Manufacturers Association to support manufacturers to think about how to address those issues of culture to retain more women. And so, um, you know, thinking about, and, and it's easier for, for organizations such as Intel, right, which have which are very large versus a small to medium sized manufacturer um and i think cynthia was talking about this earlier that many of these these folks are contractors right and they might not have the resources available to to make sort of big sweeping cultural changes but what are those small day-to-day -day things that we can do and i think you know this goes back to the advancement piece as well um in in some you know like uh, industries in, in um, Ohio, women make up about 25%, 27% of the, the, the non-traditional workforce. But then when we look at the first line supervisors, that drops to 19%. And so there's a, a drop off um, between the technician level and then to the supervisory level. So working with our employers to think through what are those career pathways for those women to make sure that they do have those that they do have access to those supervisory roles, and then uh, looking at their own culture. Um, and I'm so excited that JP uh, is you know 
catching it in his classroom and and teaching you know like hey we can't like you can't use this job the this language around like you can't you know speak like this professionally so uh, appreciative of our educators also who are who are coaching uh, the next generation to address these um, very real that's a really good point, Casey, about skilling up, and um, and that leads directly to retention. And and I think what Cynthia had to say earlier about K twelve is super important. Are any of you um, seeing or um, um, executing programs that that reach out directly to uh, K twelve in ways that you're that are being successful now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we um, so we have a couple of programs that are in the K twelve um, space. We have a um, a middle school camp um, for girls. Um, so we know that um, around sixth grade is when subjects start to become gendered. Um, so that's when science becomes for for boys, math becomes for boys, engineering becomes for boys. Um, and like, you know, some arts are for girls, right? And so um, we we have, it's, it's directed at middle school girls to disrupt that mental model from ever forming, right? It's, it's easier to disrupt a mental model than to change one. And so, uh, you know, we encourage them. And I saw um, in the chat too, the importance of confidence. Um, and so starting to build that confidence at that young age. Um, and making sure that, you know, if they are interested in working with their hands, it's absolutely great and they can continue to do that. Um, and then we also work with our high schoolers, um, especially uh, young women who might not be uh, college bound or, or, or haven't set that out to their, their guidance counselors immediately, right? They're, they're sort of graduating with, I don't really know where I'm going to go to work and I don't really think I'm going to go to college and I'm not enlisting in the army, so where do I go? Um, working with that group to help them explore uh, these, these different career pathways and, and bringing in that mentorship uh, to show them that women are working within these fields and, and sharing those very real experiences that they might have had within their career where they have faced discrimination so that you know uh, we're not sending girls, uh, young women into these careers with rose-colored glasses, but that they are absolutely aware of what it looks like. I love it. Um, middle school camp. That's smart. It's a, I feel like that's the right place um, as a as a long time um, educator. I feel like that's the right place to catch it. Anybody else have ideas, Marsha? Yeah. Well, you, oh, go ahead, yeah, Marsha. Say yeah. I was just going to say we don't have any very real specific um, programs other than to encourage our membership to take those opportunities when there's career days and things like that to go talk about it. But um, I did take a, I think that it's a good idea to have some kind of a presentation on women in the workplace and in the startup. I think uh, that's something I'm gonna work on over the next year because I, you, you there's just things like, uh, men use a bucket in the back of their truck to go to the bathroom with HVAC sometimes. And like, that's just not, not okay for, be okay for a man either, you know? And so I think having uh, some more blunt material for that kind of stuff that goes on is a good idea. I was trying to be nice with the porta potty, Marsha, but uh... Yeah, I, I, there should be like safety violations if people don't have know how to use some of that stuff. You know, like like write ups, so you know, it's a, of changing culture. But yeah, using a bucket is uh, yeah. I, I I've seen some bad stuff too. So um, or, or even like expectation of somebody having to lift a hundred pounds every you know every true. hour. Really, why do you want your men doing that either? So at some point, their back is going to go. So um, it's just safety. Yeah, yeah, good point. Good point. Um, I see we're, we're kind of ahead of schedule. Um, are there, if somebody didn't type a question in the chat, uh, if you just want to kind of something that we missed, or if you know, we have these called the brain trust here. Um, uh, if you have any other questions that you, you would like to ask, you know, we have a few minutes. Please pop on video and uh, feel free to ask your question.
I think it's important to note that um, many times the behaviors that are demonstrated are not intentional of creating exclusive environments. Um, I think it's a matter of awareness, um, um, appreciating differences, understanding those differences occur, understanding how language does impact that level of inclusivity, that sense of inclusivity. And um, it's, it's not a blame game. And, and um, I think it's super important that those of us that are working in this field work hard to bring all folks in and um, not create further distancing based on how we're approaching these problems. The problems are real, absolutely. And they're gonna take some time to go through like Robert is suggesting it. It's gonna take some time to really cure this, but it's one step at a time and we each, we each play a role there. You know, I'm gonna pop in and, and tell y'all a funny story um, about my father. My father was a teamster um, in Detroit, worked for the newspaper industry. Um, and this has got to be about 15, 20 years ago. And I was out to lunch with my dad and my stepmother. And we would, had gone into um, this restaurant. And we had sat down to eat. And the young wait staff, young woman, probably, I, she probably was 19, 20 years old, walked over the table and she said, what can I get you guys? And my father at the time was probably in his mid 70s again, a teamster from Detroit. And he turned and he looked at the young woman and he said, my wife and my daughter are not guys. He said, they are women. And it was, I still, I still tell the story still to this day because language is really important. And I, you know, you, everything that the conversation in the chat is really true. It's, it's been around a long time. It's hard to change it. People say it, well, it's not language, it's a colloquialism. And it's like, no, it's a language that discriminates. It's a language that assumes whenever we say guys, the image, and I don't know if for all of you, but the image that's in my head is a bunch of guys, a bunch of men. So I think it is this conversation about um, language is really important. Uh, and I really, for my our faculty folk on the call here. This is so important for you and so important for the conversations you have with your colleagues about how important that language is in the classroom. Um, and then of course, I think the work that Cynthia at IREC and Marcia and Casey are doing working with employers to look at that issue around language and culture is just critically important to making, to making the work environment and the educational environment safe for everybody. So thank you for what you're doing. Yes, definitely. Uh, thank, thank you, Darlene. Great comments, and I love, love that story. Um, well, real quick, I, I want everybody, listen, uh, Marsha, Casey, and Cynthia, y'all pretty much have some national organization. You're doing some innovative work. Uh, I would like for y'all to kind of share um, a little bit about next steps. If you have conferences coming up or you got scholarship opportunities or uh, publications coming out. Uh, please let us know where we could go to find that information, and so we can move. Keep keep learning. Sure, we have our uh, national conference coming up um, in November. It's the sixth through the eighth. It's in Jacksonville, uh, Florida, and it will be a uh, fun packed. Day we have activities. We also have a lot of um, opportunities to grow yourself personally, grow your business, learn about you know how to overcome our opportunities. All the things we just talked about. Um, those are what our our uh, most of the content is uh, for that. And uh, I will put information on that in the chat. Thanks. Yeah, IREC has a vision summit coming up in November, and I can share the link to that. Uh, but we're also doing a webinar series. There's two more left with Department of Energy, and it's about how to address the workforce issues with um, interconnection. 
And so those are jobs that are for engineers, policymakers, attorneys, you know, people in that space that how to diversify that workforce as well. And I can put the links to that webinar up. We're hosting it with Department of Energy and it's yield some great information. And then we've got the Alliance, which I posted and should be in the chat. That webinar series will start in a couple of weeks. And I think we've got some great content lined up for the rest of the year, but I can put those in the chat as well. Um, so our, our WISE Pathways uh, um, framework is a completely free and open education resource that's hosted very generously by Skills Commons. Um, so if you wanted to check out any of um, the curriculum that we have, we have implementation guides, we have ways to connect with different uh, partners within your community. Um, so all of those information, all of that information is available on the Skills Commons website. We also have a Wise Pathways learning community where we host uh, monthly webinars. Those will be kicking back off, I believe, in September. Uh, so you're more than welcome to join those, uh, you know, uh, you can get in touch with me through the Skills Commons website um, and we can get you uh, that, that schedule when it comes out. Um, we talk about issues related to uh, recruiting women into um, technical training and education programs, talk about retaining women within these career pathways, and we talk about culture change sort of more broadly and how to sustain these, these sort of programs and movements. So. Um, if you're interested, please uh, do not hesitate to reach out. And Casey, you keyed up a perfect introduction. So Maria, can you share a little bit about Skills Commons and about all the resources that we have stored there? Of course, my team and I, um, uh, Rick Lumadu is here and Andy Thief is also here. We, we're wearing uh, two hats. One is to support NCWE's green job. Um, uh, content development and to help with that diversity conversation and, and support and grow those pieces um, across the U.S. The other is to represent Skills Commons, and which is the largest, the world's largest open repository of workforce development and educational training materials. Um, we uh, Skills Commons was um, created under a Department of Labor initiative, almost $2 billion initiative called CAP. And it has continued to grow and um, remain uh, useful over the years. We recently had um, a $5 million download, uh, I'm sorry, 5 million download um, uh, marking point, and which tells us that People are still there and they're still using it. There, there is no need to create a, a membership or a registration on Skills Commons. Everyone is, um, is welcome to step in and, and wander around, take what looks um, worthy to you. There are all different kinds of content, content available from full courses to simulations to uh, e-texts and uh, supplemental materials such as the ones that were developed under this project for the National Green Jobs. I've posted the, the um, link into the Skills Commons um, NCWE collection in the chat. And please, when you have time, go through and take a look. A, a number of the subject matter experts are here in the room today, and they have done some impressive work around um, providing opportunities for supplemental materials for instructors that will help learners kind of uh, advance over those sometimes uh, barrier creating skill building skill builders. And so um, we we're pretty proud of this collection um, that was directed under Gerard and Darlene and we're super happy to be a part of the, the entire initiative. Uh, thank, Maria, you. Thank, you, thank you so much. It's, it's been wonderful. And everybody, I want to have Darlene close us out. Um, it's been a great honor for me. Uh, uh, Marsha, Casey, and Cynthia, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule uh, to be with us. And, um, and like I always like to sell it from Gil Scott Herring, uh, kind of a little spin on that, but you know, the Green Revolution will be inclusive and y'all are making it possible day in and day out. And the beauty of NCWE, that's why we are here for practitioners to, to increase diversity and equity 
in the workforce space and kind of guide our community colleges through those practices. Darlene, we forgot to mention about our wonderful conference coming up and you can close us out. Certainly, um, I too would like to echo thank you to Marsha, Casey and Cynthia for being and doing this. And again, our thanks to the Lumina Foundation for funding this work. Um, it's been really exciting. I also want to give a bit of a shout out. I mean, Maria posted into the um, into the chat, the toolkit that we have available for marketing and recruitment um, that's also available at the Skills Commons site. But I also want to give a shout out to Naida Wilson, who's on the call here, who really was the developer and the creator of that toolkit. Um, and it is very comprehensive. And I think it's just a uh, very useful tool for faculty to use in their programs, as well as community colleges to share with their marketing department uh, in terms of doing much more inclusive uh, marketing and recruitment for, uh, for jobs in the skilled trades and skilled crafts areas. So we um, thank you for joining us this morning. Very happy to have you here. For those of you who are not aware, NCWE has their annual conference every year in October. Uh, this year, we are October 4th and 5th. We are in Baltimore, Maryland. Come to our website. Uh, we have we have had for the last at least six, if not eight years, a strand on diversity, inclusivity, inclusion, and belonging, um, and are very proud of the work that we do in that area. Uh, and we will also have the opportunity uh, for folks who want to learn more about this uh, green jobs this grant and the work that we're doing, we, there'll be a couple of sessions focusing on the project. So I would invite you all to look at our website and to learn more about the conference and maybe join us in Baltimore. And with that, um, I'm gonna say thank you to everybody. The, uh, the, the what This conversation has been recorded. Um, and we will put it up on the Skills Commons site and we also put it up on the NCWE website. And uh, again, uh, everybody have a wonderful day. It's great, it's Friday. It's, the weather's great out there for us, for me. So have a wonderful day and see you all soon sometime in the future. So thank you all.